What do hard rock metal acts such as Avenged Sevenfold and Disturb both have in common? Artist manager Larry Jacobson, founder and CEO of World Audience, a leading artist management company. In our continuing series, Examining the Hard Rock Metal Landscape Today, we sat down to discuss the process of discovery, launching and breaking of a band, and the importance of live performance in any hard rock or metal band's career, and much, much more. This is one conversation you don't want to miss. Coming up. This episode of the Mubu TV Insider Video Series is brought to you by the Music Business Registry. The Music Business Registry is the leading music industry publisher of the most up-to-date contact information for major and independent record label A&R, music publishers, artist managers, music attorneys, music supervisors, and much, much more. The Music Business Registry is the trusted industry standard and source serving the music business community for over 30 years with the most accurate and up-to-date contact information available. Their titles include the a r Registry, the Film and Television Music Guide, the Music Publisher Registry, and the Music Attorney Registry. All of their publications are available in PDF, CSV, or online subscription. Visit musicregistry.com and use coupon code MUBUTV10 at checkout. That's musicregistry.com, coupon code MUBUTV10. When you're ready to put your music to work, musicregistry.com. My first question, Larry, um, your, your career began actually in another industry altogether before music. H- how did your career evolve in the music industry? Well, I was, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, I was a real estate attorney. And I, uh, the story I always tell, I was the only guy that used to leave and go hear Metallica play after work <laughs> and decided that I really thought the, the real estate law was boring and I wanted to get into to music, which I'd always loved and grown up around. I'd played guitar since I was 14 years old and I played in bands. And so... I uh, ended up getting a job as the number two lawyer at Giant Records. And they wow. were growing at the time and um, <clears throat> had a lot, number of really good opportunities. But one of, one of the things that happened for me was that I was, uh, after I'd been there a year, I came across a soundtrack album that every label in the business had passed on. And, uh, you know, including, by the way, Giant Records A&R wow. staff. And I went to Irving Azoff, who, uh, who owned Giant, and I said, look around. Everybody's wearing platform shoes and bell bottoms. The 70s are hot right now. This is a $300,000 deal that I can get for thirty five grand because everybody's passed. And uh, he thought it was great that somebody outside of the A&R department, even if it was just a young punk lawyer, was, uh, you know, it, that somebody outside of the A&R department wanted to bring it in. So uh, he let me do it, and I got the creative credit on it, and it went multi-platinum, and that was the soundtrack to the movie Dazed and Confused. Oh, awesome. So, uh, you know, it's one of those things where you just, you get, have the good fortune of somebody giving you an opportunity. Obviously I had created the opportunity and I had the balls to, to, to put, you know, to say, I want to go out and do this. And I think it's going to be successful. We did a follow up. It went gold. And that was sort of the beginning to the, you know, that sort of the creative segue, which has never been completely, it's never, I, I left the business side of my career behind. Right. If anything, I think it's, you know, it makes me sort of a, you know, a double threat for lack of a yeah. better word. I've got a, a good handle on the business stuff as well as, you know, loving music. One of your first big successes uh, was the discovery and signing of the rock band Disturbed. Um, can you take us through the process of discovering, launching, and breaking them as a band? Sure. <clears throat> Just cut me off if I talk too long. It's okay. Um, so uh, the A&R guys used to give me a, a stack of records. I would say to them, give me, this is when I was running Giant Records. Eventually I rose up to run that company and be wow. a, a partner in it before it was sold to Tom Warner. So... Um, what uh, I would have them give me every week, uh, you know, just a stack of what they're listening to so that I was staying up to date in terms of what was happening. And one night I went home and I was just going through the different, uh, you know, CDs that I had or cassettes, whatever it was. It was a long time ago. And I got a four song uh, cassette and I put it in. And the first song was a song called Stupefy. And the next one was a song called Down With The Sickness. Wow. And there was a song called A Want and a song called Shout, which was the Tears For Fears, Tears for Fears remake. I was going up on a so-called personal day to hear Slayer play in Phoenix the next day. And I, yeah, I called the A&R guy, Burko, and I said, uh, let's go to Chicago and fly there. I'll fly from Phoenix and let's meet that band. And I got there and just as I landed, I had never seen the band play live. I landed and I found out that everybody now wanted them. I didn't know that at the time. So I called up Irving and I got his permission to make the biggest new artist deal that we had ever offered an artist in the history of the company. Uh, I had never seen them play. I had never met them. I'd never actually even seen a picture of them. 
Wow. But, uh, but I thought those songs, if you can write those songs, you're okay in my book. And then I drove from the, I was only in there for the night. I went, drove from the airport, Tilton in Chicago uh, to meet them at dinner. And by the time I got there, they already knew because their lawyer had called them and said that we'd made this offer. And that obviously was a good way to start off the discussion because it, it said, look, we believe in you. We believe in you as, as artists. There's none of the other stuff in terms of, you know, other people, labels being involved and all that that's driving. This is just, we love you. We think you're great. And, uh, so anyway, that built the, you know, started the relationship we had with them. We had the good fortune that they made a decision to, uh, to sign with us because we didn't have the, you know, the strongest record in, in breaking rock acts, but they believed in us and our passion. And, uh, fortunately we were able to communicate that to them effectively. And, um, so we started working with them. They were making the album with Johnny K. Uh, and it was a, uh, you know, a year later, I think it was that it came out and Stupefy obviously was a huge hit. Um, and there were, you know, there's little bumps in the way. Um, but I think that the, you know, including, I think if I'm not mistaken, I think if I'm not mistaken, they were supposed to play Ozfest and then they got kicked off Ozfest before Ozfest had started. And the reason was because I think their agent, I think he was booking Slipknot and there was something going on with them. And so they decided to take it out on, on Disturbed and we were able to wow. go ahead through the, you know, the, the help, uh, uh, um, just some people that I knew who were helpful. Coincidentally, people who now booked them at CAA were helpful to us in, in getting them on the bill. And that was part of how they ended up breaking was that, uh, that appearance there. So, um, you know, there was a lot, we, even though we were part of Warner Brothers Records at the time, uh, the way it worked is we had a national staff, but we used their radio field uh, promotion staff. And at one point we were supposed to go, I don't know, March 4th, I think that 19... March 4th, 2000. And we were all set up. We've been setting up the record. Our staff have been flying all around the country. I've been flying around the country, played for programmers. And we got this call from, from a reprise at the time saying, you know what? Uh, we need you to wait because one of our albums is taking longer and we need you to wait. And I said, we can't wait. We got to go. We've been setting this album up. We're ready to, we're ready. And you know, you got to wait. And of course, you know, we were dependent on their staff and I said, we're not waiting, we're going. And I just told our staff, you know what? Well, I'm going to go with them or they'll catch up. Right. And, uh, and eventually that's exactly what happened. But, you know, so to answer your question, part of it is, you know, it's about belief. Right. It's about willing to take a chance. Um, my career probably would have been a much shorter career if Disturbed had not been successful right. after the big sort of risk that I took in, in betting on them the way that we did. Um, but that's what, you, that's what you have to do. You have to do it in, in music. You have to do it in business. You have to make decisions about when are you going to take a chance, put it on the line. And have you done that ever since where you just wanted to sign a band, sight unseen, literally not hearing them or anything since Disturbed or well, probably it, never it, happened again? Well, yeah, it did happen once actually. <laughs> oh, I, wow. yeah, the funny thing about me is I have a rule which in order to sign a band, I have to have seen them. And then the, the, some of the biggest bands in my career that I broke that rule. Wow. So, uh, and yeah, another one was Avenged Sevenfold. Wow. Um, where I heard this album and there was, you know, this, this album meaning, uh, it was sounding the seventh trumpet. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. it, they had, so the, the story of how I found event sevenfold was I pure, pure serendipity. Uh, a, uh, I had left Capitol records. I was uh, starting my own company and, uh, I called up to speak to our, uh, our money manager to talk about, you know, making plans. So right. I would start my own business. And the guy that I usually spoke to uh, wasn't there. And so his partner picks up the phone and he says, hey, Larry, it's, uh, it's Ben. Jim's on a plane today. Anything I can do to help you? And I said, oh, no, just have him call me tomorrow. I just, uh, you know, I left Capital. I'm starting my own company. And uh, have him call me. He goes, really? You know, my brother runs an independent label. Would you mind maybe going out to lunch with him and maybe you've got some tips or advice, guidance, whatever? I said, sure, I'd be happy to. And I... Uh, uh, went a couple weeks later to Van Nuys and they met Lewis Pose and his brother wow. uh, who ran Hopeless Records and he handed me a stack of the albums that they put out and that night I went home and I was listening and this minute and 26 second song uh, came on the radio called Tin Rapture and I freaked out. Wow. And uh, didn't want to be a manager which was sort of the story that I was telling in this panel a little while ago because I didn't really want to be a manager. I didn't like the hand holding, the ass kissing, that really isn't who I am. Right. And uh, uh, I was out to dinner with Andy Gould, managed, who managed Rob Zombie and, and Pantera and Rick Sales, who managed Slayer. And we were all sitting at the Lid Dome and they were, you're going to be a manager, you know? And I said, I'd start my own company, but I wasn't a manager. I said, I'm not going to be a manager. I said, you're going to be a manager. I said, I'm not going to be a manager. It's not my personality. I don't have that, you know, personality right. you two guys have. They go, you're going to be a manager. And then I discovered Avenged Sevenfold and I was a manager. <laughs> wow. The rest is history.
Larry, it's interesting hearing you describe the process because as I was listening to you, I realized that, you know, it was an entirely different era kind of then at the beginning of, you know, Disturb's career. Um, given that how hard it is in today's market to break, you know, how hard is it to break a new act in hard rock today versus back then? Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, there were a lot, even for Avenged Sevenfold, when they come, when they came on the scene, there were a lot of, you know, resources, outlets, entry points that existed, MTV, uh, multi-format radio, a little, it was fragmented, but not quite as fragmented. There was some crossover in, uh, in terms of the different stations, alternative rock, you know, some mainstream top 40, which where they didn't get mainstream top 40, but, you know, artists like Metallica obviously had that, you know, in the early part of the, well, not the early part of their career, when the Black Album Black came, came out. out yeah. um, so, and I think there was an active club scene too. I mean, people were out there trying to discover new bands. I think there was obviously the Warp Tour, which still exists. But I think that, you know, unlike, you know, now where everybody is into Coachella or some of these other large, you know, very sort of eclectic music festivals, I think that a lot of kids that are at those festivals today or at Ultra, you know, the dance music festival today, we're going to the Warp Tour, they were going to OzFest, you know, obviously OzFest still exists, uh, but I think that a lot of people at that time were trying to experience new music through a club scene that you could then work, you know, you could put your band into the club scene and then they would have the opportunity to play for people who were interested in discovering new music. You could build some sort of a regional uh, head of steam, whether, you know, if you were playing in, you know, if you're from California, you could play in Orange County, you could play Los Angeles, you could play Ventura, you could play multiple different, different spots, you could go to the Inland Empire. Um, so I think that that's much harder right now. And, you know, the, the, the bounce back effect of that is that the artists see the very narrow cast uh, set of outlets that exist. That would be, for example, you know, uh, rock radio, which is, you know, a very sort of narrow cast in right. terms of, you know, sort of a relatively, you know, sort of conservative rock. And, uh, and they try to make the same kind of music and it's a mistake because the only thing that really will help you, you know, go to the next level is doing something that's very, very different. Right. And hopefully there's a scene that becomes like that, but that's not the way it is right now. So Larry, for our viewers who are in bands and uh, you know want a career obviously in music, are there specific things that they should be doing to rise above the noise? Well, sure. I mean, the first thing that artists have to do is they really need to create art. They have to think about what they do first and foremost as art. Um, and it sounds sort of you know uh, high-minded to say that, uh, but most of what I hear feels a lot more like people sort of plugging into a scene and it's not just rock. It's basically, it's, it's basically anything. Right. Um, you know, you, you think about the artists that have come up in the last 40 years or so, and you think about how some very unique, very different acts who came out and they took chances. And I don't see a lot of chance taking right now. Right. So I think an artist, you, you need to do something different. You need to do it because it's what's in your soul, not necessarily because you think it's going to sell. Right. Um, the flip side of it is that, you know, you, you, and you obviously, you, you don't have some of the, the outlets. You don't really have a, you know, a, a, an aggregator in terms of, you know, video content right. the way that you have with MTV. YouTube is much more sort of, you know, instead of, you know, one to many, it's kind of one to one. And, uh, and that is what it is. That's the reality in terms of what we live in. Uh, you have some ability to, to, to have people, you know, to, 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 to build something through word of mouth online. But I think people misuse that. I think that, you know, that they, they, they look at their, their online uh, microphone, whether it's through their Instagram page, their Facebook page, through, uh, um, through YouTube and so forth. And they really, they show too much. People don't really like the guy next door. They like the guy next door if he's the guy next door. Right. If he's a rock star, they want him to be a little bit removed. Maybe somebody who can understand and articulate the, the 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 human condition in a way that I can't. Right. So you have to understand who I am as a person in order to be able to do that. But you can't be the person who's waking up every morning and talking about what you had for breakfast. Exactly. And that's what artists are doing today. And it, it takes away some that's that, that thing that makes them special. The, the, mystique, you know, the of mystique of it. Yeah. Larry, in the world of hard rock and metal, how important is the aspect of live performances in an acts uh, career? Well, obviously, I think it's everything. I mean, that's kind of how I built my career is, is acts who have, a, you know, a, a, you know, a star. In the case of Avenged Sevenfold, I think we have, they're all stars. 
and they all have that unique way and each guy, you know, whether it's a girl or a guy that's like, you know, somebody who's a Zachy Vengeance or a Sinister Gate fan, somebody's an M Shadows or a Johnny Christ person, they're just something that they connect with because they're all magnetic in their own way. Um, but also I think that artists need to put out, they need to make an investment. Avenged Sevenfold makes investments in their career. When, you know, there's a lot more money they could put in their pocket, but instead when they put on a show, they think about putting on a show, that, having some sort of production that's gonna be exciting, that's gonna make people feel special. And we've made very significant investments in that. And you know, to their credit, that I think has yielded a lot of fans that wanna come back and they wanna see them over and over and over again because they know the band is not simply gonna take them for granted. Right. Um, but I think ultimately, you know, you have to play, you got to play out, you have to develop your chops. You know, Avenged Sevenfold was always a great live band, but they weren't in the same category that they are today. You get that from just getting your reps in. Um, for the members of our audience who are interested in uh, pursuing a career as an artist manager, because some of our viewers are on both the business and others are on the creative side, you know, what are the most important char characteristics that they need to have to become a manager, do you think, today? Well, that's a good question. Uh, balls. <laughs> You know, it's uh, belief, right. willingness to take risk, not willing to take, not being willing to take, not being accept, not accepting the word no for an answer. Right. Um, it, it can be lonely. Uh, it can be difficult. You may have to, uh, uh, you may be unpopular and you can be unpopular with your record label. You can be unpopular with a promoter, with an agency, uh, but you, you, you have a belief and you have to have some sharp elbows. You have to have the willingness to uh, to be there on the front line. And sometimes, you know, you're the one that gets beat up uh, because nobody really wants to. Uh, Take uh, <laughs> well, they, they certainly don't want to hold the artist responsible, right? The right. artist is the rock star and all that. That's just the job. Yeah. Um, and it can be very gratifying. There's certainly I've had some very fulfilling moments when Avenged Sevenfold headline download this wow. last year. That was a, a great moment. I remembered that first a time that I'd seen them play for a couple hundred people at the Showcase Theater in Corona. Right. I remember that and I was thinking about it right then and there. Wow. Um, but, you know, that was, uh, uh, I don't know, what, what was that? That was 11 years, I guess, 12, no, no, it was 12 years. Wow. And there's a lot that took place. And obviously, you know, there was some tragedy, losing Jimmy, right. uh, the band's drummer. So, um, you know, and I guess that's something you don't know what is going to come your way. You don't you don't really have the ability to sort of uh, uh, predict and understand the, what's going to happen. I, you know, I wasn't uh, obviously prepared uh, to lose Jimmy. And yet at the same time, I had a band that wanted to, you know, thought they were going to break up. And, you know, you just kind of learn how to respond to those situations and and do, you know, do the best that you can under the circumstances. It, it occurs to me that so many aspects of the modern music industry uh, have evolved so dramatically from where they once were. Um, today, what would you say are the most important factors uh, for someone who wants to have a career, whether they're on the business side or on the creative side? Well, I tend to think, I think to, I tend to think they're the one and the same. You know, it's all about a talent, meaning it, the, the, when I say, when I mean talent, I mean the talent. Right. It's really about what they create. It's really about the art. If you are an artist, it's really about what you do that is really, you know, speaks from your soul and, and makes and makes you stand out uh, and, it, and takes chances and you run the risk that maybe you won't be uh, as commercially successful, but it's who you are and it's authentic. If you're not authentic, you're not going to succeed. And if you're on the business side, then really what it comes down to is trying to identify talent and when you find it, grab onto it, realize that Guys like me, we don't have the ability to sing and dance and make women swoon. So consequently, what we need to do is we need to find people who really had that capability and then to bring our talents as part of their team to assist them in being fairly compensated, be advancing their career in the, in the most uh, uh, productive way possible. Uh, but ultimately, it comes down to aligning yourself with greatness. You know, I always say this is not that tough of a business. I've been in the business for a long time and I've seen people who have... Um, you know, I've, I've seen artists uh, or rather uh, music industry executives who've tried to take something that wasn't all that great and they get lost in this whole idea of like, oh, it must be okay because it, the guy's staring at his shoes or it's obtuse. When you find greatness, you know, the problem is finding it. Right. And the key is not to recognize it when you find it because you'll know if you're being honest. The issue is being around the ball. 
being in the places you need to be so that you have as many opportunities as you can to find something special. Some really valuable insight there from Larry, a veteran artist manager in the world of hard rock and metal. Insiders, question of the day. What was most valuable to you in our conversation with Larry? Was it the process of discovering, launching, and breaking the band Disturbed? Or was it the specific things he recommended that bands should be doing to rise above the noise? Or was it the pieces of advice that he had for those who wanted to pursue a career in artist management? Or was it something else that connected with you? We'd love to hear from you in the comments below. Thanks as always for watching this video. Please make sure to subscribe to Mubu TV for more information on how to educate, empower, and engage your music career. In addition, we recently put together a free guide on the most important factors to look for when seeking out a manager for your music career. This is one of the most critical choices you will make in building your team. So if you're interested in receiving it, we've included a link to that in the description below. It's totally free and goes through the top do's and don'ts before you even think about reaching out to a manager, such as, where am I in my music career? How much of an audience have I built out on my own? Does the manager understand how the music business works and functions today? Do they have established relationships within the music industry? And if not, are they committed to building the necessary relationships needed for your career? This guide will provide you with some of the most crucial questions and factors you need to be aware of and asking yourself when making a decision regarding this important aspect of building your team. So if you're interested in receiving that, we'll link to it in the description below. You can also check out a summary of this episode and everything we talked about in the YouTube description as well. And if you enjoyed this video, we'd really love it if you hit the like button and let us know what other kinds of videos and types of content you would want to see on our channel. Hit us up in the comments below, and we'll see you in the next video.